Everybody say hi to Renee. Hi, Renee. Hi, hi Renee. Renee. <laughs> Thanks so. for joining us. Thanks for asking me, guys. I'm loving this. It's like I haven't seen anybody in so long. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry. Yep. I'm just getting it there. There we are. Yay. Okay. Yeah. So volume is down. How's the volume sound on your end, everybody? Good? Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. So volume is down. How's the volume sound on oh. your end, everybody? Whoa. That's good. someone's Facebook That's screen good. coming through. All right. So volume is down. How's the volume sound on your end, everybody? Oh. Whoa. Okay. That's someone's Facebook screen coming through. Everybody needs to turn off their laptops. Turn off the volume. Okay. How about now? Sounds pretty. Sounds fun. good. Yeah. Watching now. Okay. All of us plus Peter, Mary, Dennis. Yay! Yay! Hey guys. <laughs> all right. Just getting it all. Boy, there's a big echo for me. Hmm. All right. Just. Uh oh. Yeah. Hi, Just... Hi Mary. Mary's here. Oh. All right. Just... The muting it doesn't work. Just turn your volumes all the way down and and it will go away. What do you think? Just turn your volumes all the way down. Oh. Yeah, now I think you probably can't hear me or can no, you? We can. No, we can't. I can't. Oh, okay, cuz I can't hear myself. Oh, hmm. That's okay. You can hear yourself talking. That's the same as me. You don't want to hear yourself in a speaker coming back. Let's see. I want to make sure I can hear all you guys. All right. I think we're. Echo gone. No, I'm still hearing somebody's. Hey, Dennis. Hey, Rashid. Echo gone. Oh, no, I'm still hearing somebody's. Wow. It's better and better. Yeah, it's still echoey, but huh, and there's a big delay. It looks like I don't know if that's just the yeah, where Zoom is, echoey, but, but huh, I've been in my chair for like a minute. It looks like, <laughs> so. I don't know if that's just the you wanna try logging out or going into the audio settings for your computer? We will figure this out, everyone. Okay, well, what do you think? Are we any better? Yeah, let's see how that is. Okay, well, oh, no. well some, somebody still has the volume up on some device, either on their phone or something on their Facebook. So, I have, I shut down Facebook on my computer and down on my phone. Zoom is weird because you actually have to go, well, let me see. Sometimes if you can turn off the input on your... Yeah. General. It's getting to that page. Now the volume is down there, yeah. so... How about now? Well, let's talk and see. Hello? Hello. Hello, hello. Yeah. Check hello. better. I don't hear it. Okay, good. Oh, oh. What did you do? Um, I just pulled the volume down on Facebook and kept it up on Zoom. And oh, that's exactly. Still what slow. Yeah. It, it it looks like where there's a lag, a little bit of a lag with us on Facebook, but um, 
Are you putting the Zoom and Facebook on the same device? Are you watching them both simultaneously on one? Yeah, device? which I always have. So. Oh, that's why. Because yeah. I use a separate device for one and the other. That way, I can turn the sound off on one. That's the only reason I don't have that issue, I guess. Yeah, that's I think I can put it on next time on iPad. All right, I think we're good. Mary says sounds good. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. <laughs> All right, on to our show already in progress, <laughs> or not. Hi, Renee. <laughs> Hi, here we go. Renee's here. Hi, guys. So, so you wanted, our guest today um, is songwriter and wonderful artist, Renee Armand, and we wanted to talk to her about uh, a song that's near and dear to our hearts, which we have played as part of our Mustangs repertoire for a long time, and it's called This Is Me Leaving. So welcome, Miss Renee, from your Thank farm. You so Thank you. I have a question for you guys. Oh, good. Why, why did you pick that song? <laughs> it's it's special to you. How, how come it's special to you? This so song for me is one that um, I think the chorus to me always reminds me of a big round. And because we're a band that's so strong on harmonies, it just lent itself to that. I mean, we, when we first heard it from you, and every time we played it, we've always had probably three and four part harmonies. And it's one of those songs that just showcases that. So over the years, we've kind of always played it as a straight ahead country rock song. And then when we took it into the studio and brought it to Mark, he liked it. Um, and as he often does with most of the songs that we brought into him, he, he made some changes to it that uh, kind of reimagined it for us too. So. Uh, and it was fun. It sort of stretched us. Working with him stretched us. But I wanted to ask you, um, what was the, I always want to ask the writer, what was the reason behind the song? What's the story behind that song? Uh, exactly. Is it a true story? <laughs> That's what we want to know. Is it true? Yes. Yeah. They're all a little true though, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Especially if I'm going to sing them. I started out as a staff writer at a and Pretty much. But when I really started out with Carrie Chater, who's co-writer on this, Carrie was a really solid, successful staff writer at AM, and I kind of got put with him. A guy came in, the head of kind of the vice president of publishing came in. But I was singing some sort of a soundtrack thing at Studio B, in Studio B. And when I came out, he asked if I wrote songs. And I didn't, I never had, I wrote poetry and I'd been singing. So you get, you know what structure is. You don't have to go to school to figure out how to be a songwriter. It's, it's inherent in every song. And he put me with Carrie Chater. And so in the beginning I was writing stuff that was part of my poetry. So I didn't understand what they wanted um more which is stuff that other artists were going to record you know like pop stuff and i while i was there i just kept getting hit over and over and over again with more more of an education and how to do everything and this song i never got away from personal experience because there was this point where even if you're writing for another artist, which is what staff writing really was, mm -hmm. or I was signed as, as an artist and to record my own stuff, it doesn't pay bullshit on my foot. Um, if, you, if you're gonna, there's no other way to be real. That's just kind of it. So not even a little bit, almost, what, did, what was the Dylan, album it was blood on the tracks mm -hmm. well everything wasn't suffering everything wasn't blood on the tracks this one was basically an f you to um somebody it was a somebody who you know those people that tried to exercise so much control so you really were leaving oh yeah <laughs> i was gone i was gone and it was it was back in the day when you took polaroids and I really wanted to take a picture and say, this is me leaving. Oh, like ah. leaving, uh, you leaving the A&M? No, this is me leaving the relationship. That was it. This is me leaving. And 
whether or not it's subtle, you know, when you end a relationship, whether or not it's subtle or it takes a long time, eventually you can actually say whatever that final action is, however long it takes, whatever it consists of, this is me leaving. And it's, it's the equivalent of I'm done. What and about the, I mean, obviously, uh, one of the draws for us for the song was all the imagery, all the horse imagery, because of course, we're Mustangs of the West. And so I thought, well, the person who wrote that song, uh, just like when we talked to Tish Hinojosa about In the Real West, and we all, we said, well, you know, did you have the cowgirl life? And she said, no, but she had people that she knew who did live that life. She was a good friend with someone who was a cowboy. And so that for her was always a pull and I wondered about that with you when I, when I heard this song. I thought, well, this person sounds pretty clear. This person's either been around horses or um, knows enough about that to, to make it such a visual song. Oh, thank you for saying that. Because I, I, yeah, when I was little and we finally got a house, we lived in hotels. When we finally got a real house, it was in Shadow Hills, kind of, up in, it was in Big Tonga Canyon. And... I had friends, two girlfriends who are still in my life after 65 years. Yeah, almost 65 years. And they, um, yeah, 65 years. And they each had a horse. So there were three of us and two horses. So, <laughs> and we used to ride to Hanson Dam and... Um, I know Hanson Dam. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that, so riding bareback was how I started out really and truly. And I can't have, I can't have large bodied animals now because I'm alone on my farm and it's just too dangerous. If I break another bone, I'm half dead, but I have a lot of friends who have horses and yeah, I know I used to know what I was doing. Now I know a whole yeah. lot of <laughs> <laughs> Holly oh, yeah. Now, you know, goats and sheep and donkeys. I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> got a great farm going yeah but now that i have been on the road so much i had to move everybody over to somebody else's place because i would be in mexico and i'd get a phone call saying miss renee your goats are in the road <laughs> and i yeah can't right <laughs> well we have a, a couple clips should we play the song and then yeah, take a listen just that. so everybody kind of know can get to hear um some of that poetry in that song so wow, good. thank you. I grew up with horses, so I like loved it right away. <laughs> yeah. yeah, me too. And it, it, it's just so visual, that song. Hey, Suze, uh, I was going to play the song, but uh, through screen sharing, and it says that you have disabled it. But I have what? Oh, hang on a second. <laughs> this is one person can share at a time. Let me pull that up. Yeah, the lyrics are so great. I, I've always loved this song, so I was really glad that it was put into the mix for the record. And and I relate to the being a poet first, because I always, I wrote poetry in high school and college and never thought about writing a song until oh, honey. late college, you know? It's so easy. Yeah. It's I mean, so easy. And I it's so important. <laughs> to do put that. Words to the melody was the hard part. No, it's not. For me, All you have to do, the, the big the <laughs> thing is, all you do is you sing your words and then you fit your chords to the melody in your head that you're singing those words. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No boundaries. No Let's boundaries. Try. Oh, yeah. Let's try this. Yeah. Are we, are we there? Do you see it? We're there. We see it. That's great. See it? Yes. Nice. yes. <laughs> Give me half a chance at a little romance I could be a fool for love But you've got an iron hand Hidden in your velvet glove Wish I had Oh. 
and fade. <laughs> wow. Weird. That was pretty faint on my end. How about for you guys? Yeah, it was really small. Yeah, sorry about the, <laughs> the audio quality there, everybody. We're trying to figure all of this stuff out, you know. Um, learning curves. Yep. Well, it worked before, but I... Wow, that's a nice solo. Nope. Yeah, that's pretty faint. We can talk over it like a background track. Yeah, that's kind of nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, Renee, my question was, because you talked a little bit about writing and the whole um, writing, publishing world, and, and I know from my experience that it, it can be so different. Sometimes publishers will put up a blackboard and say, these are the people to write for, and these are the kinds of songs, and then other publishers like Blue Water Music, they, they more or less just said, well, you all are writer, artists, write what you want. We'll try to give it a place to land and not all of the songs will hit. But uh, a lot of times when they did hit, you know, they really connected with a, a particular artist. So ha how was that writing process with Kiri Chater? Did you feel like, um, did you bring in part of the song to it or did you have a little piece of the song? And No. To, I mean, uh, the way Carrie and I wrote for a really long time was based mostly on his generosity. And that's, I'm a co-writer. I've only written a couple of songs all by myself and I never write to a melody. They're very, it's like some people uh -huh. are really good at algebra and some people mm -hmm. are really good at geometry. I was a math major in high school and geometry just drove me insane. So. I'm kind of an algebra writer. I always write with somebody literally from the start. And I have a whole book full of, I don't have it with me, full of lines. I mean, I'll stop my car and go, and I mean, I've been doing this for 50 years. So it's not like, well, I'm a songwriter and this is how I recommend that you do it and this is how you do it. Because I just stop and write things down that I can't, that set something off. You're and a poet. poet. Yeah. yeah. And if poetry is already written, then I cannibalized my poetry for him. And literally what I was saying was, I can hear a melody in a line. And he would find the chords. I could do that myself, but it takes too long. And then you, you lose the flow. So that's my co-writing process. When it came to being a staff writer, and nobody really does that much anymore, I don't think because songwriting publishing is in the crapper. Yeah, not not like they did at that time. <laughs> yeah. So what, the, you go in and you write with somebody for three hours. And that's like almost a first date. It's that mm -hmm. popular. And if you don't click, it's embarrassing because you're stuck for three hours. And then there are people that you just have this kind of business-like kind of craft shit going on. And you write your song, two verses, a chorus, a verse, a bridge, and a chorus out kind of thing. And then what Carrie did, and Tony Burke, my other inspirational writer, and one of the Coyote sisters, Marty Gwynn, who's a visionary, and Hoyt Axton, who was a visionary. Yes. Oh, yeah. my God. So I think acid really does play a place in somebody's lives. <clears throat> so that, our, that's Hoyt, a long time ago. And fun, fun. yeah, but I just think you, it's like making love with somebody or having a drink with them. And the great writers that you co write with are the ones that you have an intimate relationship with that challenges every other intimate, it can challenge every other intimate relationship you can have. I mean, you can be in the best marriage, the best partnership in the world. And then there are things that I would write with Carrie that would leave me feeling complete in ways that other relationships didn't. Yeah. That, you know, that was Carrie. That's Tony Berg, that's Marty Gwynn, and a couple of other people I've written with through the years. I am so lucky. I'm so lucky to not have starved to death and been able to um, kind of support myself and my family by doing this. Oh, God. <laughs> Best. Plus, I get to sing, you know. Well, you and Sherry have known each other for a while. Sherry who? 
Sherry, uh, <laughs> Sherry, Sherry Rain Barnett. Barnett. Oh, we, <laughs> it, we go back. We go back to an incident with her leg. Oh my God. Yes. What do you mean? Oh my God. I made yeah. you sleep. You were totally crippled. You almost lost your leg in a motorcycle accident, and you I came, did. stayed with me. Wow. Yes. And, and in the process. I made you sleep in a loft, go up a ladder. She, she tried to make me go up a ladder with crutches. And she thought it was very hey, funny. Hey, hey. She, also, she also thought it was very funny if she took a <laughs> and and she put them across the room and left the house. <laughs> she did what? She, she would take the crutches that I had at the time and she'd put them across the room and then she'd leave the house. I think it's I called like physical like therapy. More more. Yeah. Old school. I like her exactly more. Exactly what that was called. <laughs> the ladder was like pull ups. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> Sherry, you knew, you knew Renee from the time of what? From early on and then Coyote Sisters? Yep. Well, I met Renee, and Renee, uh, you probably remember this, but I met you on the AM lot. Yeah. Yep. And which was just such a ironic and, and wonderful full circle um, thing to have experienced knowing that then the Mustangs of the West came back and did their album right there. You know, so I was pulling into the parking lot and I'm seeing in my mind's eye the picture that I took of you and Ronnie Blakely because Renee and Ronnie were doing a show at the Ash Grove. That's the first time I saw Renee perform. But I took the photographs of her. Anyway, we, be, we became friends. And, you know, since that time, we've had different uh, junctures when she had the family sisters, photographed them. Yeah, I photographed you guys and then photographed you in the caves. And oh, oh, and I have a photograph of Renee, possibly from the Ash Grove or McCabe. Um, oh, that one. Oh, I've got that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, this has just been a kind of a continuum. And um, then the last thing that happened was uh, I invited her to come when I was doing concerts in my backyard. And she came and, and played, and it was really marvelous. I mean, the place was packed. Everybody loved it. And, you know, it was just, it was just a, a wonderful gathering of current and past friends. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so it started a whole other thing. And then Renee invited me to the farm. And I came and visited her there. You went to the farm. Oh yeah, I got some beautiful photographs of her, and her, well, not actually of her, of her animals in the mm -hmm. farm. Actually, so, you guys should really plan when things start to open up again. Um, yeah, plan Puckets. on getting booked here. You should be getting booked at Puckett's for sure, and we'll see if we can. Yeah, it's a great place. Puckets and yeah. Third and Lindsley, and if it if things are still up and running, who knows if right. But it's going to be well, a little while. Yeah. It will be. I did. No, Puckets is open. Puckets oh, is ready. Okay. We're doing the word there. Heavy Drunk is going to be there. My band I'm singing in is. July it's called Heavy Drunk? Uh -huh. Yes. I like that. So, uh, Renee, you, uh, uh, Sherry told me that you're um, going to be at Flatiron Crossroads here coming up. And we were supposed to play there in March, you know, when the happened? pandemic hit. The pandemic hit. When did come and play anyway in August? So you're you're going to play there in August, is that right? At Flatiron Crossroads, depending on depending on the opening situation. Yeah, opening. So yeah, I live I live not far from that, so I hope to see you there. Oh wow! Yeah. Why don't you all just come out and join me in the show? <laughs> oh, you should. Really? I I'm I'm happy to do whatever. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, I live oh, close to there. Uh, for sure. <laughs> so Renee, Everybody how many you're Western. playing you're playing there and is that part of a tour that you're doing or do you just have select dates that you've got during that time, August? It, it, it depends completely on the COVID situation. Sure. Because I can't do that to I've got um maybe Johnston on piano. What I do I work with um Jenny Lynn Young. Jenny Lynn um was discovered by Waylon, and he was on the road with, of course, his wife, with Jesse, and um, his guitar player was Reggie Young, the most iconic, I mean, please. Yep. And, yeah, and Reggie passed um, last year. 
But Jenny plays fiddle and cello. She had her <laughs> she had her own bus and she's exquisite and so close to my heart. And um, so we're usually how I work is with Jenny and with the keyboard player or a guitar player. It's easiest to travel that way. And we'll see how it goes because we have house concerts booked in a couple of theaters in Pennsylvania, but you can't, you always have to have an escape closet at this point because too dangerous. You know, we don't know how it's going to go. So if it's good, y'all come here and stay at the farm. Yeah. We would, we would love to. Yeah. Good. And we can get, I'm hopeful. I mean, I can, it's so easy to get Puckett Puckets. They would love you at Puckett's. That's only yeah. one gig. Is it worth walking all the way from the West Coast? I don't know. We might we might have to we'd have to probably all get a van. Yeah. Huh. Well, when we recorded this song with Mark, um, we had played it the way we had always played it, which was just straight ahead kind of um, country rock song, guitar beginning, full drums. And then when we got in the studio with Mark, well, you know how the room is at A and M. Uh, which one? Had, did, which did, were you in? B we were in Studio oh. A, and he said, "Oh, up, hey. Yeah, we had the, the big room, which was amazing for drums. Oh, nice and he records in stages, so he had uh, bass, guitars in the back, drums off to the side, and then he had a little station for acoustic overdubs. And then at the front, he had the vintage mic set up, so we would just move one, two, three keeping the song to kind of have a live feel. But so we'd always play it for him a few times to show him what we were thinking about doing. And with this song, he just said, I want to try something. And he, he turned all the chairs in that little center section into a circle, the little acoustic guitar station. And they just sort of went tearing around the studio, grabbing some percussion. So weird percussion. Um, some of it was there. I think Aubrey did Angel, our production assistant, bring in some of it. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. brought a, a fun bag of toys, fun bag of percussion devices. <laughs> and then he just said, And Suzanne, what your friend Ed, Suzanne, had a bunch of stuff, right? Yeah, he brought some uh, vintage like symbols, and which was one of the parts. And um, yeah, he brought some tambourine to some older older tambourine stuff. This is yeah. so funny that you're describing these instruments as vintage and <laughs> older. <laughs> it's painful to hear it described that way. Well, we got to use a mic that Frank Sinatra recorded on. So it was, oh, that's uh, before your era. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I actually, I've sung on the Dale <laughs> studio in New York. I was actually, those were, yeah. But he, um, he had us create a percussion loop. So Suzanne, our wonderful drummer percussionist, started it off and then we all kind of um, got on the program and on the bus with these different instruments that we had and played for a couple minutes or so and he built a loop out of it. So for this live stream, uh, we kind of did our best with the instruments we had and things around the house to recreate that loop and made a video that's probably TikTok worthy, but wow. it might not be Zoom live stream worthy. <laughs> but we have a little bit of that. Hang on a second. Good. With any luck, let's see. Let me know if you all see that. Yep. Yeah. Or hear it. Don't hear it yet. There we go. There it goes. How's the volume? <laughs> oh my god, I love what you did, Susanna. <laughs> it's a peanut can with a bracelet. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we can talk over this, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should. Yeah. <laughs> what is that supposed to be called? It's kalabasa? Kalabasa? But you get the idea. I think uh, in the studio we played a Perrier bottle. Perrier, Perrier um, bottle. Yeah. That planter's can, peanut can with the mala beads on it was actually in the studio a kibasa. Wow. And I don't Molly, know what, what do you have there? Oh, a measure. It looks like a beaker from a science experiment. Well, it's it's my son. He mixes uh, oh. mixed drinks in it. It's his mixed <laughs> drink beaker. <laughs> 
anyway, that's probably enough of that, but you guys get the picture. Yeah, you guys are more fun than my goats. <laughs> well, I oh. hope so. Can we quote you? I yeah. don't know. Oh, the goats are pretty. Go my goats are a lot of fun. They were, I mean, they were until I traded them for firewood. But they're, they're they were good. <laughs> as long as they weren't the firewood. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'd like to have a goat here. I, have a, I, have a... I can arrange that, Sherry. Oh, that's right. My brother raises goats, boar goats. What, so what, what, boars? Yeah, meat goats. They're very cute. He he. They raise them raise them for breeding. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, a lot of their goats have turned into pets. Um, and it, which happens yeah, with yeah. boar goats because yeah. they're just so damn cute. Yeah, yeah, they're great. Anyway, putting <coughs> that song together, that loop, kind of you hear it, I think, throughout the whole song a little bit. Starts in the beginning, and then I think, yeah, in the choruses. Yep. And he, he, Mark changed it to a completely acoustic song. So it was just, we, we just did it right on the spot you know, switched instruments. He had me play some dobro on it, um, which of course I had never done on the song. Yeah, and I didn't know you played dobro. I didn't, I didn't before our album and I played it on three songs. <laughs> yeah, well that goes, there goes the degree in dobro. It's not necessary to do four years of dobro apparently. That's, that's true, that's true. Um, it was very elementary dobro, but it seemed to have worked for the song. And then I did an acoustic guitar solo instead of the electric guitar solo. And that turned, you know, I think, I think it was a good, it was just such a great idea. But Holly remembered what Mark said about the song before we, before, look, we did the whole recording and I don't know, I felt pretty darn good about it. And um, mm -hmm. well, when I look back and I see, we have a little video recorded um, from the studio uh, when we did the original version of it. And Mark is sitting there at the, at the board. And first I thought it'd be fun to, play it today but then I saw as he's sitting at the board he's like scratching his ear and he's kind okay. of he's not into it at all so we're not showing that but um but that he was wasn't a, a country producer oh no he doesn't so like he always tried to kind of recreate the songs and take them slightly yeah. you know a, a turn right yeah, yeah well, he, so the banjo, he's, yeah, tell us, Holly, what he said. Well, I was, the, really where it comes from is the rhythm section, because neither Suzanne nor I have any background in country music. So when we Even though play you sound in a band, like you do. Okay. well, I'm the only, well, I mean, you know, I can't, <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> but um, um, so we don't have a background in that. And that's not the kind of music that we play or I'm or really know that much about. So I, I, and Suzanne, you can correct me if I'm speaking for you, but you know, when I get into a band like this and I, and I play and I play, you know, it's like, you tend to play it pretty straight, you know, because you you get used to in country music for the bass player, th there's not a lot of scope for what you're doing. No. Uh-oh. I'm back, Holly. Come back. Come back. Frozen. 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 <laughs> Fresh frozen. That was country music not liking what she was saying. I think that was really true. Mark gave me so much scope on this. Oh. And and this was one on. Are, are you guys frozen? We can on? hear you now. I can hear you. Frozen. I still see you. We just can't Faith see. Is frozen. Mm. Anybody there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can hear I we can hear you. We lost you though, but now no. you I don't know if anybody is uh, watching. We can hear you. We just can't see you. I mean, we can see you, but you're frozen. One, two, three. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, that was just a light moment. There? Renee, are you when in doubt, when, any, when we have technical difficulties, I think I'll just play the percussion loop. Yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah, it's frozen on my, on my iPad, so I'll just talk even though I... Um, so Mark said to, to us, oh, okay, well, let's try it again with a little bit less of the hokey pokey. And he said it like with a, with a full on like Canadian accent and it was just beautiful. And it, it, what it meant was that it, it really what he meant overall was he was giving Suzanne and I the uh, ability to play, you know, not so straight. Uh Someone, Holly, said this must be the revenge of the Grand Ole Opry against Holly. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> 
<laughs> There's well, a simplicity to that kind. See that that music is melded into heavy, heavy pop music. Country music isn't the traditional form or form formulation that it used to be. So now, going back to the to the old old way it was written, it was very simple, but there was so much room for heartbreak and um, that people rested in it. It wasn't challenging to listen to and it just broke people's hearts. And if you can, if you can be, I, I love qualities in a song. This one's defiant. Yeah, it, it absolutely, it's yeah. a, it's a big, big, big goodbye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wanted to ask you a little bit about how you put Coyote Sisters together. Cause I, I think there are probably <laughs> people listening who are want who are fans there and and um, some new people who know us might want might be curious about that okay you mean how did we get how do we find each other yeah okay this is what was going on i was on the road with john denver and i was married to jim horn and we were all on the road together i'd gotten him the job with john and he went back up to his house in washington state with his two boys as soon as we got off the road and i flew home to san francisco and as I pulled up in the taxi cab from the airport, they were carrying the almost dead body of my house sitter who had just tried to commit suicide. And uh, I, there were no things, such things as hazmat crews or anything else that so was for me to clear up with some friends. And I had friends in Los Angeles, Leah Kunkel, who is Cass Elliott's sister and Leah has a magnificent musical career. Look her up. She's brilliant. She's sung with a whole bunch of people on her own, especially the Jimmy Webb songbook. She's worked with Jimmy. She's worked with Art Garfunkel. She's she's on um, James Taylor. She's on uh, Handyman. Yeah. That's what it was back up. And then she had a great friend, Marty Gwynn, who is literally a visionary. And they were all tied up with Tony Berg, part of the magnificent Berg family. So he's produced a brilliant artist. He hasn't stopped. He's another one of those visionary people. And they wanted me to be part of it somehow, but they came up to San Francisco and they had written a song about the suicide. And I was so taken apart by that. Leah, Leah understands harmonies the way I we hear we hear harmonies really easily so when i went down to la to be with them because they they made me just part of all that i ended up quitting john and becoming a coyote sister and we're working with them writing co-writing with tony singing with leah harmonically if you listen to our records nobody takes a specific part at all uh in the middle of songs, I'm switching to three different parts without having to think about it. It was that, that close. And Tony kind of ordered it all together. Um, so that's how the Coyotes came about. They came up to San Francisco and they played me the song they'd written for the fellow who'd, who'd killed himself. And we just took off. We were assigned, we were the first one of the first 15 acts to be signed to Geffen. And um, we ended up on Motown, three white women on, three middle-aged white women on Motown. That was interesting. Hold on, I'm gonna stop this phone. But we also, I'd already had a hit on Motown with, with um, Michael Jackson. So we had, rela we had relationships with all of that. Yeah. That, you know, that's how it works. You know, on the, on the, uh, <clears throat> The Coyote Sisters albums, what's so cool about it is that your voices end up being so so much like one voice yeah. that even though I was familiar with you and Leah, I would listen to songs and not know which of you was singing. I wouldn't either. Yeah, it was fa it's fantastic. I mean, it's really a, a, a unique blend because of that, even though you're not, you know, related as family. Thank you, sweetie. We got, we had, it's all by ear. A lot of people really study to learn how to sing and um, it's all about your ears. So it's, it's how you hear yourself in relation to everybody else. 
anybody can do it pretty much but there's a special kind of a thing about harmonizing i guess where you just don't have to think about it you can go you have three different four different choices of notes and whoever is not singing that note that's the one you got to get to so yeah a little to talk about music what did what did somebody say mike Mike Reed said, talking about music is like singing about football. Yeah, yeah I, so, so true. So we have a question um, in the comments. From, um, Susan says, how do you envision playing songs recorded in the studio when you're ready to perform live? So we had, that's kind of a timely question because I think Sherry's got a little clip of us. We played um, through Amaze Entertainment. We had a gig at the Higley Center. Oh, really wants to talk to somebody. <laughs> They're calling all over. I know. And, <laughs> uh, and we played this song, uh, and we kind of gave Suzanne, our drummer, um, a little showcase at the end of the song. So uh, the way we play it live, it did change, you know. Uh, and I think even though we have this version of it that will add it to, <laughs> that that will probably add some of the percussion loop. Man, it's a good reason to be doing a Zoom thing in a cave and not in your home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, could, uh, I could do something like that. Hey, um, I can try and play that clip since you kind of introduced it. Um, but everybody has to be forgiving. The clip was not very loud to begin with. I'm going to see if we can all see and hear it. Uh, it's imperfect, but it illustrates what we're talking about. Um, also, Renee, just a little sidebar, uh, Leah has been our lawyer. She is the lawyer for Mustangs of the West, in case you don't know that. That's why I was like, why did that name sound familiar? Now they're trying to get you. Who the hell is calling? <laughs> Can you just connect that? I did. They're trying all of us. <laughs> they're trying all of us. There's really. another one. Yeah. All right, let me see if I can share the screen here now. Please forgive whatever happens, but it'll give you an idea of what we're talking about. All right, Suze. <laughs> okay, here we go. Go for it. Okay, let's try it. Here we go. Did I hit share? You are screen share. Oh We're sharing. Wow. Are you seeing this? Yep. Okay, the hearing is going to be the problem, but we'll do what we can. Here we go. Wow. Oh, let me start. You guys hear that okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, sort of. Yeah. You can't hear much of anything, honestly. the original Mustang way to play it. Wow. <laughs> yep, yep. So we'll see what happens when we get on stage again. Um, but yes, that's what we that's what we had been doing with it. And uh, <clears throat> that's incredible. <laughs> oh, I want to ask a question. What was it like touring um, when you were touring as a woman 
with anybody, Ooh. like John Denver. Yeah. What was, how was that? Was it hotels? Was it a bus? Was it a van? Like, were you oh. sharing rooms with just whoever? Like, what was, how was the style? What was it? Okay, so when I first started touring, I went on the road, I was um, on the Playboy Club circuit. On the what? <laughs> Say what? Playboy? Say what? The Playboy Club circuit. They um, had fabulously constructed venues, which were at least two stories. And they had incredible sound and they had in-house trios. So what I would do was I, op I was the opening act 45 minutes for a comedian. And wow. I got paid $150 a week. Yo. <laughs> and paid all my own expenses, including airfare, buses, or anything else. I traveled with my own arrangements, which were really high end arrangements because they came, a lot of them from Woody Herman and Harry James. So I had great, incredible, I mean, the guys that did those arrangements were iconic as hell and I um you'd walk in the opening night was always a Monday uh you had an hour to rehearse two shows a night three on the weekends Sunday off and you would be booked for two weeks at a time and I stayed in flea bag hotels paid 75 bucks a week so it was like ten dollars a night and came home with enough to be able to sleep on someone else's couch. And so that's that touring. And then I did some international stuff when I had a record and that was A&M supported stuff. And then I worked, I did with Neil Sedaka for a while and that was all perfectly nice backup singer. Ugh. And then there was the John Denver stuff. And that was extremely hard because of the misogyny not mm -hmm. just, but um, extremely high end. We had a private plane. We had a entire an entire floor at every hotel was dedicated privately. Everything was picked up. It, uh, the per diem was taken care of. Any hotel expenses were complete. It was extremely, and uh, some of the people were absolutely miserable. Within I liked everything up until that that moment. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, everybody, I mean, and it was. Some of the stuff that occurred was so anti, I was, I was not their wife. I was not the stewardess, named her flight attendant. I was not their nurse. I was not their mother. I was not their sister. I was not their daughter. I was not sexually their partner. And they resented, sometimes some of the people were so resentful because they couldn't, the guys could not categorize me. I truly preferred the, um, crews who did who did all the lighting and the sound and everything else it was um i mean i worked for five and a half years i everybody else as they were introduced on stage and um, was introduced with their credits i had more songwriting credits and probably more albums as an artist to my credit and i and they were introduced by what they'd done and they'd go around and when John would get to me and he would say, and the lovely lady who graces our stage. Now I would, <laughs> and I, you know, not as RCA recording artist, um, she's written for blah, 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 but, and uh, nothing, not, no credits. I was never given credits. I didn't resent it. I spoke to him about it. It was his show. He made the choice to embody me that way. I was making half what the musicians were making Wow. Were they up front with you about that? Or did you find it out some other way? I found it out from my then husband, Jim Horn. He was making twice what I was making. And oh, I got the job. both in the band together. Yes. You, did and you know also, they, they expected, at first, they expected me to share a hotel room with Jim. And everybody had their own rooms. And I'm working the same amount of time that everyone is working. I'm on stage. In fact, I've got a wardrobe that they don't have to deal with. They've got instruments and that's all being taken care of with the crew. And I just said, I'm sorry, when the other guys in the band start sleeping with each other, 
in this in in their same rooms, then I will share a hotel room with my husband. But I'm here to work. I'm not here to have a marriage. Amen. I girl. hope you have a book. What? I said I hope you have a book. I will tell you. <laughs> what, I will tell you what it was like in some ways. I went to get on our private plane, and John's father, Dutch, who Dutch was a he had he held Air Force records. He was a test pilot and a pilot. Dutch stood at the top as I was coming up the stairs and I had a bag and a bag. So I did not have my hands. I got to the top of the, you know, where you, the level part where you just walk in the door and he was standing in the door and he grabbed both my breasts. Broad daylight. Wow. Those were the days. And the way I <laughs> The way I had to handle oh. it, uh, that's John's dad. And the way I had to handle it was to basically just, okay, grow up. Because I in your suitcase, huh? Probably wished you could have. What was your favorite gig? My favorite gig at all? Yeah. I think, you know what? I actually don't have a, a favorite gig because there's a quality. I started out, I was, my mentor was Carmen Faye, the great jazz singer. She took shows with baby. And I just basically, my favorite gigs are the ones I've gone to where I've been gobsmacked by someone's work. And that would be in my, the old days in LA when you could go to the clubs in a certain section of town. I mean, Miles Davis was there and Carmen Ingus and John Coltrane. And I, when I saw, when I see women performing who are, untrammeled by anything except the thing that burns inside my favorite gigs i loved working with john because it was i got paid a lot and it was all taken care of that was fun but then i got bored I got bored I, yeah. I didn't develop as a writer anymore and it helped me financially to stabilize you know how you know how it works when you're an artist or when you're a songwriter one year you can earn fifty thousand dollars or one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and for the next three years you earn three hundred dollars. So you have to save and keep it all going that way. Do you have time now that you're out at the farm? Do you write a lot? How's yes. Yes. yeah, yeah, and the and the writing, I have. Um, it 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 never stops. So at my age, I'll be seventy five in October. And I should, my vibrato should have, um, you know, vocal cords are like rubber bands and they eventually just stretch out and go, which uh, is uh, horrendous. And I, it hasn't done that yet. And I can still, I can still sing and it's, it won't leave me alone. It's, it's the call. It's that horrible thing where God sort of comes down and she goes, I'm not, you, you, you can't get away from this. And it's not about applause and it's not about money or being famous or anything. None of that. It never has been. I've never had ambition and I've really avoided celebrity so successfully that I live on a farm and nobody bothers me much. Farm's probably a great place to write. Anywhere is. But for me, I, it depends on who I'm with and what's killing me and what I can't live, what I can't live with inside of me anymore like that but other people's words matter just as much this isn't about me and it hasn't been for years i have a question do you feel like um because i've heard different theory, like people different writers have different pro not just different processes but a kind of a a belief if you will about where where the muse who the muse is or where the music comes from so do you feel like a lot of this comes from like within, and I know that's a loaded question, but I've also heard that people just feel like they're kind of downloading just whatever's coming from the universe and it would go, it could go into any number of people that are open to it, but we all process things uniquely and individually when we get them. So I mean, what does it feel like? What it feels like for me is I, I, I get it from you. I get it from the way you're looking at me. I get it from, I get it from, um, the ecstatic, and I'm not using that word lightly. I went on a pilgrimage. I was allowed. 
I was given I was given an invitation to join a pilgrimage to of uh, Sufi pilgrims from all over the world. I mean, politicians and lawyers and doctors. It wasn't a bunch of poor people that were dragging themselves through the dust uh, to to the birthplace of a Rumi because I want to sing Rumi. I want to sing the Coleman Barks translation. And yeah, that's some beautiful poetry. Yes, that's the ecstatic. That's the beloved, mm -hmm. and the beloved comes. It isn't spiritual. It's visceral. I can I can feel. When I'm with somebody that inspires me, it's what they're doing for me. And that's what I write about. It's the, it's the common ground. And there's, no, there's no separation. There's no work entailed. It's, I, get, I get to sing this life. And all those words, they don't, they don't go away. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for, especially if you're, um, some people tend to channel music and some people channel words, but it does feel that way as though they kind of just show up sometimes. Yep. Um, I think, I know for me, I, a lot of times I just have to have that quiet isolation to do it. And that's why I thought, yeah, a place where you don't have a lot of distractions or you say, you know. Are you alone. kidding? Is the it? distractions? <laughs> There's somebody eating the chickens. <laughs> Literally, there's no, I mean, there's, oh, I have to go weed before I lose. Oh, it's the Japanese beetles. Oh, my God. It's a, no. Yeah, is, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, I, of course, it's it. stuff like that that you have to do. But at the end of the day, there's probably a certain amount of quiet that you've got. Um, I live out in the country, too. So yeah. I, I cherish that. I mean, yeah, there's there are always but chores I wanna, that I have to do. I want to write about. Everything that they say is wrong in uh, codependency. I want to write constantly about the static thing of loving somebody or the amazement that you feel in a connection or the loss of it is the big feeder. And the only thing I say that's really, really important, <laughs> the only thing that I say that's really, really important is watch what you're saying, watch your vowels. <laughs> Holly like rocking out. Yeah, pick words I think that Suzanne had a question. Suzanne, I see it there. I see that formation of that question. <laughs> music in the background. Hey, Renee, do you have any stories, or is there something you want to share about uh, working with Little Feet? Oh my God! <laughs> wow, how come you know about that? Well, I, I saw that in uh, Sherry's. Um, you know, sort of small, short little bio, and I love that band. And I just I would like you to share something if you want to. Sure. Um, so I didn't really know the guys, and my then husband, -ish, I guess we were married by then, was George Massenburg. And um, George is, I mean, he's got a lifetime Grammy achievement for his contribution to the recording industry, the sound, his parametric equalizers, who he's engineered for, what he's done is so incredible. And he, uh, his best friend was Lowell George, his bestie. And so he started working with Little Feet from the beginning of Little Feet. And I, Billy Payne is one of my favorite piano players in the world ever love Billy so, so much. He's on so many records that you don't know. It's Billy and of course, Little Feet. So I was pregnant. I was about six and a half months, almost seven months pregnant. And they called me, I was here in the farm and they called me to come out to LA and um, sing on the record. And George was already out there recording. So I got on a plane and I'm 42 years old and I should not have done that. And I almost lost my baby. He was born two months early and I was stuck in Los Angeles but I did sing on that record. Oh so my God. that's my involvement with Little Feet. But also Billy has played on three or four things. They did a soundtrack for some sort of a movie. And I never do this. I wrote the words to it. It's body body. And it's the combination of a sacrament and a highly sexual thing. And it's called body body because the words are in this country, you are my skin. I believe I'll always find you. And then it's holy, holy how you follow me body into body. And these arms are a house and a house 
as a heart that beats and recalls and music plays inside the head. And that's, that was to their soundtrack that he wrote. And then there's another song that's just me and Billy and it's Texas love song. And it's incomparable. So when I record, I record with people who are so extraordinary at what they do that they feed me. That's when I got just when Leon Russell played on some of my stuff. He he told me what he told me while we were recording. He he could tell me what we taught we he answered me and then gave me another place to go. That's part of recording for me. And I and it was all live. If I can't do it live I don't want to do it. I mean, overdubbing sucks. So yeah. I hope yeah, I Richie you. Richie Hayward was one of my was one of our favorite drummers ever. Isn't he? Oh, he was yeah. unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. I was married to a great drummer who ended up insane. His name was Jim Gordon and he was and he co-wrote Layla. He was Derek and the Dominoes. And he's part of all that 70s, late 60s, 70s major hit stuff. Oh, wow. He says insane. Yes, he <laughs> lost it. He went, he, he uh, became paranoid schizophrenic and he killed his own mother. Oh, horrible. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of drummers, though, did you know Tom Philman when you toured with Little Feet? No. I think he played drums. I never, I didn't tour with Little Feet. Oh, okay. All right. I just, cool. They didn't have a girl singer. I mean, they had Nicolette Larson for about five minutes, but. Oh. <laughs> I can't wait to come visit you on your farm, Renee. Please come. come Thank you. Yep. It was nice and to I hope to see you in you. your, your little you. rectangle. <laughs> I, I hope to see you at Flatiron. I, I hope to be there. Guys, yeah. show up. Maybe we'll make a pilgrimage out there. You actually should. We can have a really fun time. And then it wouldn't all be on my head. <laughs> I'm going to ride a horse instead of walk, if that's OK. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. It shouldn't take too long. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank <laughs> you, Renee. Thank you so yeah. much. Thanks, thanks, for all the, thanks to all our friends and fans for uh, Tuning yeah. in for this today, meeting Renee. This is my first time meeting Renee as well. So this has been wow. really cool. I feel like I know you already. I know. <laughs> no. The poetry people. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, when thing, one more thing, when things start up again, um, also, you know, I just kudos to our fiddle player, Aubrey, who I know you brought up um, Waylon. You know, she tours with Waylon's son, Shooter. Shooter no Jim. kidding. Yeah. yeah. Four years, I think now, right? Three or four years. And I've been playing with him since 14 and touring with him since uh, 17. Yeah. Oh my God. He's only 19 now. <laughs> 2017 is when we hit the road full time. Right. But before that, we were just doing one offs and, and sessions. So, but I did meet, mo I've met most of Wayland's Waymores at this point. Like, I think we actually met, you know, everyone before, you know, like you said, some people have passed away in the last year or so. So, yeah. Yeah, the Waymores play at Puckett's. Okay. All yeah. yeah. Yeah, Tommy Townsend is a good friend of the band and, you know, all those guys. Yeah, come come to Puckett's. You can all we'll book you at Puckett's. We will hang. We'll come to Puckett's. That sounds yeah. great, Renee. That sounds great. <laughs> I have to go, everybody. Thanks again. Bye, Bye guys. Bye. Okay. Bye. Check out all the comments because we've got lots of them on Facebook, I think. Can't wait. But we can. Hey. We can still respond to them. See you down the road. Have a great weekend. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Girl down. This, this is me. me.